Hello, hello. Um, I had my camera off. Good morning, Erin. How are you? I'm well. Good morning, artists. How are you? Great. Well, I didn't do the usual intro. Um, welcome to In Your Element. This is the news edition today. Uh, I'm Artis Kadu, CEO and founder of Element 451, and Aaron always with me here. So um, we are excited for today's episode. Um, actually, we're excited for today because uh, we're going to be live, or at least you get a chance to um, have to see quite a quite a bit of us today. You know, we're going to be um, you know here on in your element. We have a uh, another. Uh, webinar uh, with our friends at CoVideo, talking all about video messaging and personalized video. And that's part of our uh, IA Live uh, series. That's at one o'clock. And then at two o'clock, we have Eastern. This is Eastern time. At two o'clock, we have a uh, presentation with our friends and partners at Southeast Missouri State at the UPSIA conference. Uh, so if you haven't registered for that one, I'm not sure if there's any uh, opportunity to register for it. But the topic is going to be really interesting about amplifying um, your opportunities and possibly, you know, how do you make a small team seem like a really, really large team with automation, personalization, um, and, and all the greatness that, that comes with uh, some of the modern tools. And this is a use case in Southeast Missouri. So with that being said, um, today, interesting topic, we're going to be talking about um, the prolific... Um, ransomware issues that a lot of schools are tackling. Um, currently, we have, you know, partners and schools that we know uh, we have direct contact with that have been hit with this, um, this attacks. Um, and we also, um, there's, there's just a bunch of news out there around this. So we want, what we want to do today is we want to kind of go through it, what it is, um, you know, go through the news and, and how that's affected and then perhaps dive a little bit deeper in terms of what are some of the things that uh, and how, how should you be thinking about this exactly what it is. So you can read the article, but at the end of it, you know, we'll try to break it down a little bit more. So, Erin, um, let's let's get started. Let's get started. So we have a report was done, a survey conducted across different sectors on um, cyber attacks. And it turns out education is the most attacked of different industries. Um, and also the amount of money that it costs them between, you know, the ransom itself and downtime and all of that. You can imagine the domino effect of having a cyber attack at a university or um, a K through 12 school. It's also the highest, the most expensive um, kind of problem to deal with. And, um, you know, a lot of this, the article mentions that there was that just switch, like rapid fire switch to, digital when the pandemic yeah. happened. And a lot of, for understandable reasons, there was just that urgency to get students online and that continuity continuity between learning. And so security was kind of left out of the picture, unfortunately. And it's understandable now, but how do we kind of patch that? What's going on? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, you know, security is, um, is always, top of mind for us as, you know, software developers and, and kind of product builders and technology build. However, when you think about it, you know, it, it doesn't come into effect. There's no significant uh, impact on cybersecurity unless there is a breach event or there is an event where this happens. So it's like taking your vitamins, so to speak, or taking your, um, or taking or exercising regularly because well, actually, it's not like exercising, but, you know, really, it's just one of those in a lifetime events that happens, but you have to protect against it. So I want to dive a little bit deeper in terms of what what this means, what a ransomware attack is and, and, and how, you know, malicious actors can get um, through and, and kind of what that means for the school. Um, so what's your understanding, Aaron? 
so, you know, I've watched 60 Minutes a few times. They have episodes on this. At, um, hospitals, I think, is what they spoke about, which also critical information and just that urgency. You got to keep going, keep going. So it's in some way your system could be just one of them gets infiltrated and maybe you lose all your data and then whoever is conducting the attack is like, okay, I'm going to keep everything. So you can't do anything until you pay me money. So it's the same kind of ransom in like, I don't know, Taken. I haven't seen this movie, but I hear that it's a lot about that stuff. Um, so it's like yes. Taken for your whole institution, which is terrible because you've got critical things going on. And we have an example. There are a couple of community colleges yes. who they just had to shut down their cl yeah. classes because it exactly. just comes at full stop. Yeah. Um, so that's yeah. my understanding of kind of if yeah. I was in the like crisis center mode of the university, what would be happening? Yeah. Yeah. So just um, so so the mechanics of the way this happens is um, usually it starts with um, somebody having access to your data. Right. And that data can be student files. Uh, it can be a shared drive. It can be. Uh, something on, on on Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever it is, wherever you're holding this information or systems, for example, databases. So they can get access to those different systems. But the way they do it, it's, you know, th there's different mechanisms, but the most common way is through phishing attacks, right? And, and the way that happens is that they're impersonating another person. They're trying to get information. So it's really important to have really good security or, or really good. So cybersecurity, it's not having systems in place to detect, but it's also about education, educating your users, educating your end users on um, how this happens. So um, when those phishing attacks happen, basically they're impersonating somebody and saying, hey, give me your credentials or they're pretending to be somebody they're not, and then they're trying to get more credentials so they can get access to systems. Once they do that, um, what ends up happening is that now they have control of those systems, but it's not the control of the system itself, it's the actual data, because what they're doing is they're, making, they're, they're grabbing that data, and then they are encrypting that data, right? So they're, they're grabbing it, they're encrypting it, and now you can't get access to that data unless um, you know the key to that particular, um, you know, encryption of those files. So you can have the data, you can have the garb, you know, basically, but you can't do anything with it. So that's the part that's the ransomware. So what they're doing is then most of the time, in order for you to verify that, that they actually have the data that they think you think they have, you can ask them for a verification and you can say, hey, can, and of course, at this time, you probably are talking to the FBI, you know, at this point, because that's that's a federal matter. So they're coming to the picture. Um, there is other uh, firms, cybersecurity firms or negotiators that are involved in this in this idea once this happens. And the idea is that they're trying to get as much money out of you as possible. So it's a negotiation at the end. Right. And a lot of schools or a lot of different companies, they end up not paying that ransom. But, you know, if they have the data in another place where they couldn't have gone to it, for example, an offsite backup or something else, then they're able to bring that system up really quickly without having to pay. But if they haven't done those things, which is part of a really good security kind of measure and, and as a matter of fact, Element right now is going through a SOC 2 audit and all of these security uh, uh, kind of compliance and security measures, like we're going through that ourselves. And it's it, it, there, it puts a burden on the, on the business and it puts a burden on the institution in order to maintain all this uh, compliance, right? It, it's very, very... Um, time intensive and is very kind of resource intensive as well. So you're, they're holding that encryption, you're negotiating with them, they can give you access, or they can say, here is a file. So you know that we have the data that, um, so we're, you know, we're actually telling the truth. Um, and then what happens after that is you have multiple options, right? So then you're negotiating, they, re you know, they release the, 
the data or they give you the key, you get access to that data. So now you're back up and running. A lot of schools, what they've done is because they have backups, they're, they're, not, they're negotiating, but at the same time, they're bringing their systems back online. The first part, usually why the systems get shut down is because they have no idea what has been compromised. Mm -hmm. So they're changing passwords of everybody. They're changing um, all the credentials of every, every system because they have no idea how they got in. Um, or, you know, they might have a, a slight idea, but, you know, you still need to change those because they don't know what else has been compromised. Um, so that becomes really interesting because then is, it becomes an insurance issue, mm -hmm. right? Is the insurance paying for it? Of course, every institution or every company nowadays has to have cyber insurance, but at what levels and whatnot. Um, so it becomes really difficult to, um, to kind of stop. And Aaron, what you mentioned about institutions being the target for this, it is exactly because of, you know, cyber security takes a, a backseat sometimes to actually making things go and the student is the center of it, and it takes a lot of time and, and resources to do it. So what ends up happening is that security kind of gets left on the side a little bit as well. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, we know the, the level of sophistication um, on IT departments across schools is just varies so widely. You know, exactly. you have huge, really well-funded, so, you know, they've got a whole department working on this. And then other schools just aren't necessarily staffed up in those same ways. And at the end of the day, these are, uh, you know, criminals. So I've seen a lot of TV, as I've alluded to earlier in this uh, show, they go for people who are, you know, don't have the, that are more vulnerable. And so they can look for those schools that they know they can easily get into. Um, and then also the article mentions that holiday times or any time of that makes busy times for schools, yep. those are riskier times too, because they know the, you know, victim on the, the other side. Down. Yes, yep. exactly. Guard is down and need to be up and running is heightened. Exactly. exactly. So it's kind of a perfect storm yep. or opportunity. Depends on how so, you so something to think about and, you know, some really good measures are, again, you know, training, training, training. I would say the majority of these uh, attacks are through um, uh, what they call, um, is it human engineering or social engineering? Right. Sorry, that's the word for it. So it's all social engineering. It's not that they broke your password code or right. it's not that they hacked into it. like it's usually social engineering it's they they got somebody to give them a piece of information that they need to get to a system they can't just get it so um it's all most of it is about training 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 right absolutely yeah they mentioned that you know it used to be a lot more automated type of attacks and kind of brute force but now it's, you know, going after your staff. And, you know, I, we, we get messages sometimes saying that you're buying us a, um, your CEO, that's how it arrives to me, is <laughs> buying you gift cards and give him your, that's you right. know, some kind of piece of information. And there's that psychology there of like, oh, it's my boss. Of course. I, 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 I always that. ask, I always ask everybody to, to yeah. give me gift cards. So. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, that's how we're actually paid here. At <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, so the, yeah, it's 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 a very big challenge, and um, I was definitely thinking about that. Cybersecurity insurance must be another. It, it, these are all burdens on an industry that is already struggling. It, um, it is. It is. But it is the the new normal, and I yes. think that's that's not going to go away, right? And there's only so much that. Uh, the government or federal government can do, um, you know, you shut down an operation, another one pops up. And these are basically somebody writes the piece of software that, that kind of scans and does all the things and then it gets handed off and you basically have subcontractors, so to speak. So it's like franchisees who are using those botnets or they were using that software. And then the main person, maybe they get a cut of it or so it's, it's an, you know, it's an industry rather than, and it's all about the money, right? They right. they don't want to, they don't care about your data. They don't necessarily think they're after, they're not after that data. They just care about the ransomware and the money at the end of the day. 
Right. Yep. And that data that they get also, depending on what it is, they can sell that again. So it's completely. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. And that is the threat. That is one of the biggest threats. It's like, if you don't pay it, we are going to now sell that data on the, you know, make that publicly available, which is a bigger issue yes. for a school. So that's, that is one of the biggest motivators for paying that ransomware is not to have that student personalized personal data in the black market or perhaps uh, out there. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. As I mentioned, there was a couple of schools that um, they mentioned in particular on inside higher ed to community colleges. And um, one had to shut down for a couple of days and one is a whole week off. And then you can imagine that then impacts uh, final schedules and the students. So it's, um, it's a complex yeah. problem to have. And yeah, but a little goes a long way as far as, you know, training people and being just mindful of what information you're giving, um, what, where you're using passwords and all of that. Um, yeah. it, it, it's very hard for us to Monday morning quarterback this well, Wednesday morning yes. quarterback for yes. us right now, but it's really difficult to be in the situation where the, you were the CIO or the CTO of that school and, or the president, and you have to make those decisions. Um, so it's, it's really, really difficult. So, yeah. So on a different note, we will take a look next at kind of technology and what it's enabling in positive ways in higher education. And I thought this one I picked out, especially for you artists, cause it mentions NFTs, NFTs and yeah, it's a good topic to, to talk about. Um, and I, so this particular article talks about NFTs and how they could be used with credentials. Mm -hmm. And I was hoping maybe I think a lot of people know about or hear about NFTs in the sense of this um, in the art world of mm -hmm. this digital art that you could buy. And it seems kind of really wacky if you're on the outside of it and you're just hearing about it. But it's actually really cool and wanted to get your take on what it could mean for institutions as they education is kind of disrupted and the way that we think about how do you get credentialed? How are the credentials honored and deemed credible? How that all works? What's your take on it? Yeah, yeah. So so the um, essentially NFT stands for non-fungible token. And, you know, at the end of the day, everything works on what we call the blockchain. And the blockchain is really... Um, think about it as a, a bank has a ledger, but rather than uh, that ledger, and, and so you go to a bank, you have you have a ledger, and that you you can basically write something in there, and now you have a you know you have a page number, and you have an indication of where that piece of information is on that ledger, right? So that's that's your location of it. And now you keep right, everybody keeps writing and you're just appending information to that ledger. So that's the blockchain essentially, is that you're writing encrypted information on that ledger and you have the location of where that is and you have a key to decipher what that means, right? Or what that is. Now, what ends up happening is that we, have, we know about the, the blockchain, we know about Bitcoin being one of them, there's Ethereum. So Ethereum is, again, another platform, but essentially at the end of the day, what ends up happening is that the, the blockchain or their, the, the cool use of the blockchain is not the ledger itself, but it is actually the, think about it as you can now have program codes or, or you can have code coding and programs run within that blockchain itself. So the platform itself says, hey, um, in order for me to, you know, put you can put that ledger in here, but then you can also run some arbitrary code in there. And what that allows you to do is now you have what are called smart contracts as part of this. So the smart contracts are built on top of the blockchain. So now you can see how digitally you have that place in the ledger and now you can add, you know, an NFT in there, representation of an art piece, a contract. But the smart contracts are really cool because you can build logic on these smart contracts. And that's where it becomes really exciting for credentials because now you can have credentials or your certificate or something in 
or, or, or perhaps your, even your diploma and even your, um, your transcript, for example, as, as a, in a blockchain. And what that means is that you can, anybody can now take a look at that as long as you give them access to it, right? So they can verify that something is true in that blockchain, right? They can see that there is, there is a, a ledger in there. They might not see essentially what the information is inside, or if you, there's different ways for it, but you can see and, and everybody can see it and they can verify that this information was written by this person and it was put on this ledger and it verifies that it's, you know, owned by this other person. So it makes credentials really easy because until now, we assume that the, like we're placing our trust in the institution. The institution is saying, okay, I'm giving you a diploma. But now anytime that you need to, like, how do I verify that's, that's a real diploma that you're, or in your resume that you're telling me that you actually attended this school? I have no idea unless you give me your transcript or unless I call in and I verify with the school. But with digital um, credentials, you can bake a lot more than just the name of the course in there. You can bake things like, you know, the skill sets or, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of competencies and things like that, which becomes really, really powerful because now they can tie back into the workplace and it can be much more powerful. So, so you can have smaller buildable block, you know, credentials based on, Hey, I only took this, this midterm, for example, or, you know, I only had, you know, this particular class, um, this portion of the class. So, so it becomes really powerful because the way that we're now going about education is we're breaking it down to smaller and smaller pieces. Think about you're looking at a, you know, a, a series of videos online, or you have maybe just a couple of hours here, you're getting a certificate or you're getting a micro credential. So th that's, that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah, at the risk of giving away a billion dollar idea, yes. I'm imagining a day when there is something like LinkedIn and instead of you're entering all this, la, 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 I did this at this place and all these bullets and all these verbs, um, you just have blocks of the courses you've done, the places you've gotten full degrees or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. And that's just, you carry that around everywhere and then so for companies who are looking to hire that's it. they say oh that's that's legit and um the one of the funniest but absurd things about universities is that the whole transcript system is still <laughs> like call call up or we'll fax it to you um i know we deal so, with that every yeah. single day mm -hmm, mm -hmm, every day mm -hmm. so yeah that that's what i'm imagining somebody's probably working on right now we are, we are, um, as part of our uh, enrollment analytics course, we are issuing completion certificates and they will be blockchain digital certificates as well. So you'll be part, you'll be, um, you'll be able to share them as well. So as part of that course, we are issuing those. So, uh, keep an eye out in the next uh, couple of weeks, but nice. All right. Lo love to see the disruption. Yeah, yeah, this is really, it's really exciting what's happening in this. And of course, this talks about the, the metaverse and, mm -hmm. and kind of the, the idea of um, digital spaces and, and how that's, you know, enabling basically confirmation that it is who you say it is and these things actually matter and can be, you know, representations of something physical. Uh, think about Nike. Um, what they have done and they have actually taken <laughs> um, they've made sneakers, like they've taken the copyright of sneakers and, and in, in this metaverse. Um, so they've, they've kind of, they own that now, right? So they own that, that idea. So anyways, um, more to come. It's gonna be really, really exciting. Something to think about. It's hard to explain because when you think about it, it's like you can say, well, that piece of art, I can just make a copy of it. Like, why would I care? <laughs> you know, what somebody holds as the true representation of it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like you have to be in that world and you have to think about it, but art is just one small component yes. of it. 
Yeah. And there's lots of great podcasts um, and people talking about this and where it can go and um, seeing it applied to something more kind of practical. um, I think it's helpful to see the potential of it and not kind of get distracted with all the tech stuff. It's just like, oh, wow. Uh, So everybody knows I went to this school and I can just carry that around. That's going to be super helpful. So Erin, do you know what, so this is, um, um, what is this? So we've had web 1.0, web Mm 2.0. So this is web 3.0. Yeah. 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 We've been through all those webs together, actually. That's right. Yeah. I remember web 2.0 was, was a big deal. So yeah, web yeah. 3.0. I'm, so I'm ready. We're ready. New products, new innovations. Yeah, yeah. Coming to a metaverse near you. Near you. That's right. <laughs> well, it's great seeing you, everybody. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll see you uh, later during our other um, other events. Uh, if not, then we'll, we'll be back on Monday with more product focused uh, in your element episode. All right. Thanks, Artis. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, Aaron. Bye.